Government in the appeals, TNNA and Secretary of State for Home Department, and AA Afghanistan against the Secretary of State for the Home Department. Lord Tilson will explain the judgment of the court. In recent years, many unaccompanied children from Afghanistan have entered the UK in the back of a lorry and claimed asylum. There are EU regulations which govern how asylum applicants, including unaccompanied children, are to be treated. There are three EU directives which together make up a code. <clears throat> These three appeals are unconnected except that they all involve young Afghanis who came to the UK in the way I have described. <clears throat> they claimed asylum on the grounds that they were under threat from the Taliban, but their stories were disbelieved and their claims were dismissed. <clears throat> the appeals involve two questions of law regarding different aspects of the EU regulations. <clears throat> One aspect concerns the appeal process. The regulations require member states to ensure that applicants have, I quote, the right to an effective remedy before a court or tribunal against a decision taken on uh, their application for asylum. <clears throat> Under the UK legislation, as it was at the time that we're concerned with, a person had a right of appeal against a refusal of permission to enter or remain in the UK, or against a decision to refuse to vary a person's permission to remain here, or a decision to remove them. <clears throat> Additionally, if an asylum applicant was refused at asylum, but given permission to stay here for over a year, they had an immediate right of appeal against the refusal of asylum. In other words, they didn't have to wait until they were on the point of removal before uh, issuing an appeal. <clears throat> but if they were given leave to remain for a year or less, there was no right of appeal until such time as an application to extend their leave was refused or a decision was taken to remove them. <clears throat> the reason for that limitation was that in circumstances where there's a large influx of asylum claimants from a country in turmoil, and it's not immediately practicable to return all those whose applications are turned down, it has been the practice of successive Home Secretaries to grant leave to remain for a matter of months with a view to reconsidering whether they should be allowed to stay at the end of that period when hopefully um, the uh, conditions in the state of origin may have settled. <laughs> To allow an immediate right of appeal in those circumstances would run the risk of clogging up the appeal system at a time when it was unnecessary because the case was due to be reviewed shortly in any event. <clears throat> in the case of unaccompanied children, it's also been the settled policy of the Home Secretary not to return them unless there are... Um, suitable provisions for their reception. And so, such children are routinely given permission to remain until the age of 17 and a half. <clears throat> the appellants TN and MA were both aged over 16 and a half when their applications for asylum were refused. They were given leave to remain until 17 and a half, but because that was less than a year, they didn't have an immediate right of appeal. They say that they were therefore denied an effective <coughs> remedy against the rejection of their asylum claim as required by the EU regulations. The Court of Appeal rejected that argument and this court unanimously agrees with the Court of Appeal. The fact that those appellants had to wait a matter of months before appealing did not amount to the denial of an effective remedy. The other aspect of the appeals is quite different. Under EU and UK law, 
the Home Secretary is bound to take into account the best interests of any child when deciding any asylum case. Uh, as part of that general duty, there's also a specific duty to endeavour to trace members of the child's family as soon as possible. <coughs> In these instances, the Home Secretary failed to do so, although it's far from clear that there would have been any real chance of tracing them. Each of the appellants appealed to the first tier tribunal and on upwards to the upper tribunal. Um, the, in the cases of MH and AA, their accounts were disbelieved and their appeals were dismissed. In the case of TN, the upper tribunal set aside the Home Secretary's decision because of the failure to have used best endeavours to trace his family and sent the case back for re-decision by the Home Secretary, which is where it remains pending the decision of this court. It's argued on behalf of all of them that if the tracing duty had been properly carried out, it may have resulted in evidence supporting their case. In these circumstances, it's said that the tribunal ought to have um, formed a presumption in their favour that their account was credible unless it was plainly incapable of belief and should therefore have allowed their appeals or made findings requiring the Home Secretary to give them unconditional leave to remain. <clears throat> this court unanimously rejects those arguments. The tribunals to which they appealed had to decide their appeals on the evidence which was before it. The appellants could have asked the tribunal for an adjournment in order for the Home Secretary to carry out her obligation in relation to tracing, but that didn't happen, and the tribunal had to decide the case on the evidence before it. The question for the tribunal was whether each appellant was entitled to asylum status, and it had no basis to start with a presumption either for or against them. If the evidence did not show that the appellant was entitled to asylum status, it would be wrong for the court to compel the Home Secretary to grant leave to remain as a sanction for her failure to endeavour to trace. On the evidence before the tribunals, they were amply justified in disbelieving the claims, and these appeals are therefore dismissed. 